Good afternoon or good morning, as is appropriate and suits your time zone. Welcome to the second week of the African Parliamentarians Forum. Because we have a few new people, I will introduce myself in the program again. My name is Shannon Smith. I'm the Director of Engagement and Professor of Practice at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Last week, we started our conversation about the roles of parliamentarians in national security. Our two distinguished panelists, Dr. Ken Apollo and Mr. David Abramowitz, talked candidly about the balance or imbalance of power between legislatures and executives and about some of the tools that exist, even in unequal systems. Hearings, meetings, public and private letters, and public engagements were all mentioned. Two other points they emphasized were, one, the value of relationships across branches and across parties, and two, the power of expertise. That is the power that a parliamentarian develops by becoming expert in certain areas. Ken Apollo also offered an explanation of legislative roles that might be useful for us to revisit. Ken defined the legislative role as carrying out oversight, especially of budgets. He stressed that parliaments could make policies sticky, as he put it, or long lasting and durable by passing legislation. He pointed out that parliamentarians serve as the voice of the people to the executive and can serve as a fire alarm for problems the executive may not know about or might be choosing to downplay. Dr. Apollo, Defined oversight is including the following actions. Enforcing the rules, making sure the laws and processes are set out for the security sector are followed. Managing budgets and exercising the legislative responsibilities of examining and approving budgets. Collecting, using, and disseminating information so that the executive branch and presumably the public knows what is going on within the security sector. Developing and using informal chat channels to communicate and share concerns and ideas with security sector actors and others. And finally, building relationships with executive branch leaders and with colleagues. Those are all useful points to consider. I would also urge you to look at the syllabus for this course that is on the Africa Center website. In the suggested readings for today, we have included a report in French and English from the Interparliamentary Union. That report offered a useful framework that is called the triple A criteria. The first A, number one, is authority. Does Parliament have the legal power and space to execute oversight over the security sector? After authority, number two is ability. Does Parliament have the necessary resources, staff, access to classified information and national security expertise. Number three, attitude. Are members of parliament willing to hold the security sector accountable for its actions? These are not questions just for African parliamentarians. You could ask them of every parliament or legislature in the world. This gives us a good launching point for today's discussion. Today, we have two distinguished speakers who will help us navigate oversight of the security sector, Ms. Kemi Okunyoto and Ms. Amanata Tase. They are going to share their insights into some key tools to carry out oversight, promote accountability, and combat corruption. They will also help us consider how we define security and how to consider the roles of women and youth in terms of how parliaments work in promoting security for all. And that's especially appropriate this week uh, since International Women's Day just occurred. Ms. Amanata Kase is Senior Resident Director in Burkina Faso for the National Democratic Institute, or NDI, where she has worked since 2004 to strengthen political parties. She has worked with parties to build coalitions, develop policy positions and political messages, engage in strategic planning, and promote greater women's participation and leadership in politics. Kase has also supported NDI's regional programming through technical assistance to program participants in Guinea and Mali. The Honorable Ms. Kase is a, herself a former member of parliament in her native Senegal and was elected twice to local office. She served as president for the Senegalese Council of Women 
from 1998 to 2004. She holds a master's degree from the University of Paris, Nanterre. Ms. Okonyoto is the executive director of the Rule of Law and Empowerment Initiative, also known as Partners West Africa and Nigeria, a non-governmental organization dedicated to enhancing civic citizens' participation and improving security governance in Nigeria and West Africa broadly. Kami has over 15 years experience in justice, security sector and governance issues in Nigeria and West Africa and in NGO management. She is particularly interested in police accountability, citizens engagement with security institutions, the evolution of non-state actors and their contributions to improving public safety in the security environment, as well as gender and policing, criminal justice systems reforms, mainstreaming women participation in security and governance issues, and election security management. She has led multiple teams and programs in promoting police accountability. She's a graduate of the Faculty of Law, University of Lagos, a member of the Nigeria Bar Association, the Africa Security Sector, and a very frequent contributor to and partner with the Africa Center. And she is Secretary General of the Nigeria Chapter of the Alumni of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. With that, I would invite both our panelists to turn on their cameras, please. And we will now hear first um, from Ms. Kase. Um, who will uh, share insights from her experience in both as parliamentarian and as a uh, very experienced NGO practitioner working with legislators. Manata, over to you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Shannon. Thank you so much, Shannon. Thank you to uh, the African Center to give me the opportunity to participate in this exchange on the role of parliaments, especially in the security sector. I was listening to your first introduction of the, your introduction, and it is true we had the opportunity to see many problems where that parliamentarians face. And to return to the theme, today's theme, I believe that the panelists who are here, the participants who are here, I don't need to remind you uh, in terms of what we expect of uh, parliamentarians and their role, their legislative role, and what uh, the citizens expect of their parliaments in terms of accountability, in terms of um, what influences and touches and impacts on, on citizens. Everybody agrees that if there is an, uh, a legislative or, organ that is important um, and if there is a link between in the government with people, it is the legislative branch. And in terms of processes, in terms of tools that the legislative branch has, we're going to speak of those. And we're also going to speak to see how efficient these tools are and that will allow the parliamentarians to properly play their roles to for the government to be uh, more accountable in terms of the policy made and in terms of properly using the resources that are available to them. There are, of course, tools that you all know, are aware of. There's the budget. These, there are budgets that, there are tools that are uh, more informative, that are more uh, to enlighten. And then there are tools that are more um, tools of oversight. In terms of tools, the ones that we look at the most closely are the budgetary tools because it, it allows the legislators to authorize the government to have resources to um, engage in, to, to, to work on policies and put in policies into place. This is important because sometimes when there are discussions, budgetary discussions, pre-budgetary discussions, 
we can question uh, policies. We can. Uh, so it is at the budgetary levels and budgetary talks that we can um, we can enforce the legitimacy of different policies. In all of our parliaments, especially in Francophone countries, there are commissions, committees that are dedicated to for defense and security. We will come back to the composition of these committees, but we they can go deeper into issues during plenary sessions. These committees, uh, commissions have an important role uh, because they can go into various issues more deeply. There is also everything in terms of what we speak of in terms of uh, hearings, um, the option to have the government respond to question. The government also can use um, investigations, parliamentary investigations in the field to, to verify and ensure that things are taking place. There are also options and possibilities that are offered um, to participate in the development of policies we know that there are the separations of powers, but in terms of general policy on national security, parliamentarians do have the possibility of intervening on these issues. Now, in terms of anything that allows the, in terms of sanctions, in terms of investigations, we are also able to do this but we want to do it efficiently. So we come back to the issue of the committees. For example, the Defense and Security Committee that exists in many Francophone countries. These committees have a few um, obstacles or difficulties sometimes. Oftentimes, it is not the first, Oftentimes, the commissions are not the first place that the parliamentarians go for assistance, and there are reasons for this. For a long time, these committees had a lot of trouble ac accessing information, uh, being able to use the information and expertise to, to, to look into them. They are having they were having difficulty because because um, each time the uh, legislators changed and there were new elections, um, oftentimes there was a turnover and it was hard to access all information. If we look at the situation of countries that are, um, that are affected by violent extremism, et cetera, these problems, these are the countries where it is even more difficult accessing uh, confidential information, or classified information. There's uh, there's uh, the classified information is, is it's, so it's difficult for parliamentarians to access strategic information. And so this has touched uh, and, and, and diminished the capability of parliamentarians to act in these areas. In terms of in terms of the availability of training and the necessity of not um, sharing classified information, there is also the issue of when the government has um, uh, put into place its budget, sometimes a year later, sometimes two later, we have a situation where uh there is a law that that validates all that took place beforehand but 
if the commission members have changed or if the there are new people who have been elected, it's very difficult sometimes to maintain efficiency in these matters. I have also looked in terms of uh, in other countries, we sometimes can see at one point the oral questions that were brought up by parliamentarians to the government and to the ministers. But there are often few questions related to security and defense issues. I do not know why, but there are other questions seem to um, take more importance, perhaps because it's easier to access information in other domains. So the separation of powers sometimes Parliamentarians are do not know enough about different topics to take on fully their roles. And to this, if we add the, the issues of defense and security, even less information is available, even less knowledge is available. And and, and for example, for a, it is important to have a briefing for the uh, parliamentarians from the um, military so that from the chief of staff so that the parliamentarians can understand the difficulties and the issues that the military face. So we need to have knowledge, uh, this knowledge without the knowledge, how can we um, have oversight of the, of the military? So if we don't have good knowledge, of those sectors, uh, it's difficult to really have dialogue with the ministries of defense and security. So it's necessary to, to really become experts in those domains. And in what is missing oftentimes in these in parliaments, that they lack technical support. And sometimes there will only be one or two assistants per parliamentarian who really might, who, who need to support the parliamentarians in at each step in each step of the way in terms of their legislative responsibilities. And that is one aspect uh, that needs to be reinforced. Uh, they, they need more support, more administrative support. And this is lacking often. And oftentimes it's not a sustainable support because there's a turnover. I could also speak of other issues, but I think one of the panelists, earlier panelists, spoke much of the necessity for parliamentarians to put in place conditions once they are in those positions. And, and that is formal, official or unofficial collaboration between the various experts in the sector. And, uh, and the ministries also must respect the separation of uh, power and understand how things work, how good governance works. When I was speaking earlier of expertise and know-how, there are parliaments that have established commissions or committees, such as I have been mentioning. It's important to have an orientation session for the parliamentarians who will be part of this commission, this committee. So they have at least a baseline of information before beginning their term. This is one way that we can strengthen parliament so it is more efficient. There are trainings uh, available. Unfortunately, oftentimes they depend on outside partners. There's not enough uh, targeted training for parliamentarians uh, who work on these committees in various committees, be it uh, education, health, uh, many different areas. Parliamentarians sometimes, oftentimes in other domains, parliamentarians can do their own research. But when it 
when we are speaking of specialized committees, uh, such as defense and security, oftentimes the governments are not very open in terms of sharing information. Shannon, I would like to, I would like to uh, leave time for other panelists and participants to to speak and to ask questions on also the necessity of taking into account gender. Uh, the, it's part of a holistic approach, actually. The parliamentarians are there to be the link between the citizens and the government and to in assure that there is inclusion of all persons, women, young people, vulnerable populations, and to see how defense and security policies affect their lives and what must be done to ensure their safety. And we can speak of this again later. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much for an excellent start for our conversation today. Before we go to Kemi, I, I wanted to have one or two follow-up questions for you, if I might. Um, you talked about the the difficulties about serving on defense commissions or defense committees and and that the more serious the is security issues sometimes the, the harder it is to get information and to understand things so if a member themselves is not um a veteran of military service um it may be more difficult i assume to, to carry out oversight or of, of the issue um, could you expand a little bit about ways that a member can build up knowledge about the military and security issues? I think, I think I was uh, recalling, uh, I was speaking of the first panel who said that we, who said that parliamentarians must not only have access to information, but that they must also know the different ministries that they have oversight over. I remember a collaboration we had once, we, uh, with a, a committee of a defense committee. Uh, we, we visited a, a kazern, a, a, a military base, and we organized a, a debriefing of the chief of staff uh, with the parliamentary commission. And I think that this collaboration can be official or non-official so that specialists can have access and government workers can have access, as the panelists have said. We don't need to be aggressive in our questioning and in calling people, but we want to have good information. Unfortunately, for too long, there were um, uh, barriers between the executive and the uh, parliamentarians in terms of security and defense. There was distrust between the different powers, and this made the sharing of information very difficult. But we must really insist that the different partners, both tech technical and financial assistance can include legislators, parliamentarians, when they uh, adopt programs um, on questions of security and defense. Oftentimes, parliamentarians are not included as these programs are developed. And it's only when the programs need to be ratified that they are called upon. So it's really a question of openness and uh, to be able to reassure that uh, strategic and sensitive information, classified information won't be divulged to the public, but 
we need to see how we can better take into account the concerns of the population in terms of security and defense issues rather than be rather than uh, be aggressive in our questioning of government officials because there is a distrust between different powers especially in countries that are in difficult situations where there is a, a lot of insecurity and problems in the sectors of security thank you Thank you. That, that's a very good segue for us, I think, to, to Kemi's remarks, given the amount of time and expertise she has developed in, in working as a bridge in part between um, governments and people and in dealing with some of these sensitive issues. So Kemi, over to you, please. Thank you. Um, thanks, Aminata, for making my job easy and um, laying the foundation for my uh, presentation. Um, I'll just start from where Aminata has stopped because I'm looking at how parliamentarians can engage with police and gendarmerie. And from what um, um, some of the points that she has raised, one of the areas I would emphasize on is um, making laws. So the primary responsibility of being in parliament is um, looking at lawmaking. So we could, I mean, parliamentarians can look at laws that exist and look at the gaps that um, some of the challenges that um, either the police or the gendarmeries are having within the public safety security environment and see if these laws should be reviewed. And a good example for us in country is the recently passed um, police um, act in Nigeria. It took more than 10 or 15 years, more 10, 15 years for that law to be passed. It went through various, um, um, various um, tenor of the parliamentarians. And at every point in time, it was reviewed. It was um, stakeholder, um, stakeholder meetings were held, um, public hearings. I think we had more than three or four public hearings on the police, on the police act before it was finalized and it was passed by the National Assembly and sent to the president for accent in August, 2020. Another one closely related to the enactment of laws is looking at the international treaties and conventions that the countries sign up to and looking at how they can be domesticated in country because the system we have in Nigeria, it's not an automatic implementation. It has to be dom domesticated in country. Um, um, I've had some, some discussions with um, some colleagues that work with um, the parliament. And one of the areas they bring up is at times when some of these um, international treaties or laws or conventions are being, are, we're signing on to them. There are no discussions or engagement with parliament. You know, there are no members of parliament on some of these committees that have these discussions at high level. So there are times when we are already signatory, when it comes back home, it's difficult for domestication because of various interests that would come into it at the national level. Then we look at um, parliamentarians approving major appointments. So there are some key appointments that go to the parliament for confirmation. And this is also an area where they can hold, they can, they can exercise their influence and their level of power and authority. Budgets, Aminata has talked about budgets. Hearings on political issues or issues of national interest are also uh, key areas where they can um, um, hold police, I'll say police and gendarmerie accountable. A good example for me would be the situation in the northeastern part of Nigeria. I know that there have been series of invitations by parliament to service chiefs, to 
police, at times even to certain stakeholders on some of these naughty national issues to get their views, to get their perspective on some of this, uh, on these issues. And it's also because parliament basically, will, you, you, we can say, are the, are, the, are the arm of government that really represents citizens because they are accountable to their constituents and they are tied to either senatorial districts or different parts of the or some geopolitical zoning and they all come together as a main influence so it's not either or they represent their people in the parliament um when we look at this different er er elements and how they can play their role more within the domestic space where they find their, themselves a quick one that usually would come to mind is appropriation so when they're appropriating and their, their budget hearings or budget defense, the question you ask is how do this defense process go? Um, in country here in Nigeria, I know we have a national security strategy. The national security strategy should be a roadmap to where we want to be in the in the couple of years where the when the strategy is supposed to be implemented is the parliament aware of the national security strategy such that it can use it to interrogate um, 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 executive um, commissions mdas that bring together budget and see if their budgets are speaking to what the national issues are or the overriding national objective in the next in the year they are looking at do they have a process of reviewing the implementation of budgets to and to see how the budgets were being implemented um some people would say some of my some when you discuss with them um, other actors they'll tell you appropriation is not released so when you appropriate and you approve appropriation, what is released to these um, state agencies? And then how uh, do they make use of the, uh, of the allocation that has been released? That interface, I believe, is a role that the parliament can play effectively because they stand as a bridge between executive and the members of the public. For the members of the public, for the citizens, the average citizens, what we want to see is deliverable of the impl of, of, of the dividends, of, of, of the dividends of democracy and how this affects our day-to-day -day, um, life. Then when we look at establishing mechanisms for getting input from the citizens, is that possible? Is that in place? Do they have mechanisms in their constituencies, in their in their in, in their in their bases that allow members of their community or their constituencies to give them feedback on some not on some issues natural in, because we're talking public safety and security here and we're looking at police and we're looking at security on security challenges apart from the ones they hear you know um they read from the papers the ones they hear on the floor of the house and the ones they hear um or watch on TV? Do they have periodic meetings, town hall meetings with their constituencies? And when you're now talking with your constituencies, are you just looking at party members or you're opening it because you go beyond, you're representing of, you're representing the whole community, not only your, your political party. So are you engaging with the women and the youth group in, in a form that it's a structured, constructive manner to take their issues on board and you can bring it and you can amplify their issues at the national level either at the state house of assembly or at the national um, assembly depending on where the um, the parliamentarian is um, is functioning or has been elected to function um, we have the special committees, um, either committee on police affairs, committee on public hearing or public petitions that look at some of these issues in bits and pieces. I just wonder if it's not if if it's not an area of interest to look at how we can work across some committees. So if you look at, if I raise again, police issues, for example, police issues can cut across Committee on Women Affairs, because there can be issues relating to women 
that are targeted at the police? Is it possible, could it be issues relating to recruitment? And of course, when you're talking recruitment into the police force, we expect that it is the young people that will be interested in joining, not people over 40 or 50. So how are you working with the committee, the youth co co committee focused on youth to look at streamlining the recruitment mechanism and the recruitment process such that you're having more young people engaged and taking an interest in joining the the institution or the organization or what the interest of those that are already in the organization if they if they if what they are getting the work the work um environment is conducive for them and is and is also enabling for them to be their best because that's what this country is paying them to do you know and um especially i'd like to mention a committee that exists that i found out that exists here in nigeria is a committee of women in parliament so it's a committee of all women in parliament and there is a chair of that committee so one would take that such a committee engages across on all issues that such a committee should take an interest on issues relating to women within the security sector issues relating to women that come into the parliament on if and that is aside from what they are facing as parliamentarians within the within parliament the one we've we keep stressing on the one important role of parliament as a bridge between the public and um and the government that they are that arm of government that are that are supposed to be a bridge and when we look at that you one area that i would really love to stress upon is the framework for engaging with citizens so i've raised this before and we looked at the constituency um, model and that reports back to your constituency engagement with your constituency but wouldn't it make sense to map your constituency so that you know the demography of your constituency because it's not one size fits all you might have a way of engaging with um maybe religious actors and it might be difficult it might be a different way of engaging particularly with young people and we know that young people make up um like 65 to 70 percent of the population so it is very important that they are engaged and that the young um, the com when we talk of young people it's not only men it's the it's you have the young men you have the young women you know you have persons with disability within that um all cluster also so how are we looking at their issue how how, how are parliamentarians looking at their issues and putting their issues on the table and then when you're lo even looking at the budget which is one of the key areas key tools of accountability how are you looking at the budget vis-a-vis -vis plans you know so are the budgets in isolation or are the budgets coming with an annual plan for that which speaks to what the organizations particularly police or gendarmerie or military want to achieve that year and then are there milestones and targets that are in place that would allow for routine review and um evaluation um we had talked uh, we we talked about the public hearing and the how we can make use of public hearing and dialogues and i'll stress here engagement with relevant civil society organizations that are working in these areas is it i mean um you have i i know that there was a time um under one of the um, past um national security advisors in country that there was a there was a periodic meeting between the nsa and civil society organizations what it allowed to do what it allowed us to do was to put our issues on the table and get a first-hand response um from the from the then nsa and he also had the opportunity of giving feedback 
through of, uh, on, on government's position and why certain actions were being taken. You know, it creates, it, it builds trust. It also creates an avenue for constructive engagement. And we do not need to resort to protest all the time. You know, it also helps you to identify who key strategic leaders are or influencers within a space, who they are and how to engage with them. And they have the prerogative of going back to engage also with their own community. Finally, I'll look at the tools for combating corruption. So the first one we'll talk about would also still be the budget, but then the budget, I'm wondering how, if we are really making use of the budget appropriately. Um, some years back, um, sitting on the, was it the medium term review of, of one of some of the ministries, over, one of the oversight ministries on the police in Nigeria. And they were reeling out their line items. I was curious because I asked myself, a computer is made up of a desktop, a keypad, the CPU, that's a complete computer, right? And then when you have a line item of five, 50 keyboards, separate, um, 50 um, screens separate, 50 CPUs separate. So I had to ask, but what's a computer? Is a computer broken down into parts or a computer comes um, together? So just giving an example of how much drilling goes into budget review. Do you look, yes, you have a four year tenor. We know that there is the possibility of not coming back for a second term or a third term as the case may be. But during that first, during the four year tenor that you have, do you look, do you compare the budget of one year to another? So as to gauge performance. Do you ask questions looking at the same budget, trying to determine how the progression is going or is there a retrogression and against which plan, you know. Um, um, also looking at when one does that, it's possible that it's, it's most likely that you're helping to reduce opportunities for corruption, you know. And for those that sit on the technical committees, the specialized committees, like the committees on police affairs, defense, and what have you, there is a need to be grounded uh, to have a good understanding of the sector that you are oversighting so that they don't come back and fly the kite of you do not understand. You're not a military person. You're not a policeman. So you do not understand what we're talking about. So that's most time keeps you know, it keeps parliamentarians back. And there are opportunities because there are trainings, there are resources, there are a lot of work that has been gone, that has gone into documenting what oversight should look like, what, how you can engage with, um, with, with, um, with the military's security agencies as a parliamentarian, drilling down question by question. It's just to get hold of some of these resources. And to get hold of the resources means you need to be interested in getting hold of the resources. You don't want to be just one of the many that are there and doing the usual kind of work. This would establish a process of transparency and ensure strong um, strong um, supervision. I would also end on the issue of conflict of interest. And for conflict of interest, I would say that it is not possible to for one to oversight effectively when one possibly is a contractor or a consultant to any of the agencies you're supposed to be oversighting. It 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 it, it, um, it whittles down the level of independence that one would have and be able to really stand firm and overlook and streamline and ask the naughty de um, detailed questions that at times are not pleasant to ask, but needs to be asked and needs responses. Thank you. Thank you. And Thanks to both of you now for, for a great sort of set of discussions. Um, I think we, we've heard a lot of you hear about um, the, the role of parliaments um, in engaging with, with security sector, but also engaging with civil society and about how civil society 
can really be a resource. Um, I particularly liked uh, given the, the week we are in the mention of the Women's Caucus um, and about how that can be a useful resource. Um, the idea of working across committees um, and finding a framework for engaging with, with citizens, that, that there's finding structures for um, constructive engagement here.